Psychedelics today. This is your host, Joe Moore, coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Today on the show, we have an interesting episode, different from what we've done before. Uh, Some of you may have caught this on YouTube. The content is essentially a conversation between Dr. Andrew Gallimore and uh, Dr. Peter Schwarstead Hughes, um, both Englishmen and quite quite interesting characters in their own right. You've heard from Dr. Gallimore and uh, Peter Schwarstead Hughes on the show before, and both are very intelligent folks, and they discuss uh, Andrew Gallimore's alien information theory book that came out this year, and Peter kind of challenges Andrew on a few points around... Um, you know, the philosophical aspects of, of how his theory works out. And it's, uh, it's potentially quite technical, but I think if you're interested in like, what, what is the validity of the DMT experience, this could be a really interesting episode for you. Gets, gets into a lot of nuance around this stuff. So I hope you enjoy it. And, uh, let's see here. If you want to help us out, tell a friend, please. Um, the next best way to help us out is to join us on our upcoming live courses. We've got uh, live supported editions of Navigating Psychedelics. You've heard plenty about Navigating Psychedelics here on the show. It is a very comprehensive way to understand the landscape of psychedelia, um, understand some of the problems, uh, some of the dangers, and how to go through successfully and with more safety than you otherwise would Uh, be able to. It's just a a great way to have a foundation uh, through these pretty wild experiences that you can have on psychedelics and all the personalities out there and um, how to really protect yourself. So hope you like it. Check it out. Um, You can find more at psychedelicstoday.com under online education. And our live editions come with uh, a copy of each of our books, hard copies, the trip journal and the Um, integration workbook and five live supported classes with Kyle and Joe, Um, (laughs) Kyle and me. (laughs) So it's quite the, it's quite the course. We've done it a number of times. The clinician one may be sold out by the time you see this, but there's still a general course that you can jump in it into and check out. Um, It's still applicable. If you're a therapist, it's worth doing the class anyway, even though you might not have, um, you know, other clinical folks in the course with you, it's still really worthwhile seeing what um, a psychedelic audience wants to talk about, how they talk about drugs, how they explore uh, psychedelic compounds and states, and uh, could give you a better foothold in um, the integration world and, and how to do this work. And for those of you not in a professional space, like this is a great course for you too. Like if you just want, you're an undergrad or you're, you know, a lawyer in your mid forties or something like this is a great way to understand what all these people are talking about. This is a confusing space, highly complicated space. And we really simplify it with a, with a framework that comes from a pioneer in LSD psychotherapy research and uh, Dr. Stanislav Groff, who also uh, was the co-creator of holotropic breathwork, which is the lineage Kyle and I come from. So yeah, I guess that's about it. So if you want to learn more psychedelicstoday.com and you can click on online ed and see our offerings there. Hope you enjoy this episode with Dr. Andrew Gallimore and Peter Schwerstead Hughes, philosopher of mind from England. So I don't know who's the host and who's the... <laughs> well, I guess I'm the one being uh, defending my thesis. <laughs> I guess you're the host. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, here begins a new podcast in itself, eh? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Why mm-hmm. not? <laughs> um, okay, well, um, what should I say? Um, so, I read your book, deeply impressed with it. I, I know your work yeah. anyway. I think I think um, in Breaking Convention 2013, you were, mm. I gave a talk, and you were the first one to ask me a question on I was indeed. Bergson, yeah. so, Bergson, yes. <laughs> so uh, we've come full circle here, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you going to BC this year? You are, aren't you? I'm going to be there, yep. Yeah. I'm giving a couple of lectures. So I'll be giving a, a talk on 
more of the kind of the psychedelic and the brain kind of in, in, sort of psychedelic information. I don't want to call it that. That's James Kent's word. Um, that was the um, <laughs> the um, kind of um, yeah, sort of information in the brain and how how psychedelics affect um, you know kind of parts of the book basically that okay. describes the way that that the um, psychedelics affect the way the brain generates information and that kind of thing. And then a talk on the more kind of uh, out there stuff on um, the extended state uh, DMT stuff as well. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Well, is Rick Stresman coming as well for that? Um, I don't think he is. No. No. He's a bit shy and doesn't like to travel very much these days. So I think getting him, I think the, cl- the best you'd get would be a, a Skype. I think with Rick. Right. Yeah. Okay. We'll have to get him on our podcast one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> Um, okay. Um, talking about conferences, I'm actually organizing a philosophy of psychedelics conference at Exeter uh-huh. University in uh, April 2020. So um, maybe you'd be interested in attending I, that. I Japan would be interested. It's um, whether, whether or not I can um, get there is, is kind of the issue. It's, yeah, of course. You know, it's, it's a long way to travel. And, um, well, you are on the other side of the world, of course. I'm on, sorry, I've got some... The, the bin men are just running down the street, so there's a noise there. That's hopefully it's not too distracting. All right, no worries. Um, okay, well, listen. I um, so I reviewed your book, and um, I have the review here. We've got yes. it there, and I've got your book here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, I, I, I think I was fair, as fair as, from my own point of view as I could be, and um, of course it, there were critical elements. I mean, you know, if you introduce a brand new cosmology into the yes. world, you're going to yes. of course have to expect yes. um, some kickback because, you know, basically it says everyone else is, is wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it's implicitly, that's what it means. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, you know, in, yeah. in philosophy, I mean, okay, so you're a computational neuro, neurobiologist. Yeah. I'm a philosopher of mine. Um, but in philosophy, at least, you know, you expect um, uh, criticism, you know, of everything you write, basically. And in that way, you sort of, you know, in theory, um, you evolve. You sort of, um, you know, through natural selection, you get to the truth. In theory, right, in truth, right. it's yeah. very egotistical. But, um, so, um, what, 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 is there any particular point in that uh, review that you would like to come back on? Well, I mean, there are there are a number of things that I would say. There are base. There are perhaps three kind of broad uh, problems that you kind of pointed out. Um, the, the first one was um, the idea of information, basically, and 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 my uh, position that you know the electron was the example given, um, and 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 you. Uh, that I said that it, that it was purely information, and then you said, "Well, actually," and you got a, a, a critique of that. So we'll, we'll talk about that for sure. Yeah. That's uh, number one. That's number one, and, and that I think I can, uh, I will kind of defend my position. The second major point was regarding um, consciousness itself, and and um, I think you kind of drew some conclusions about what I you thought I said, uh, <laughs> and that perhaps so. Actually, I think we actually we actually agree with each other. Uh, okay. to a large extent there uh, so we can yeah, it's a misinterpretation yeah yeah I think it's a matter of interpretation um, okay. and then there was um, quite a lot of stuff you talk about in terms of um, you know dimensions and uh, you know Kant and um, you know string theory and M theory and all this kind of stuff and I think I don't think there's anything broadly incorrect about what you've said but I think we can kind of discuss your ideas there I think that would that would be interesting and then there are little bits, bits here and there that I would like to kind of um, discuss, I think. Um, sure. But, I mean, I get the first thing, actually, I mean, at the beginning of the, the review, you say um, um, that the originality of the work pushes it further towards art, but further away from truth, right? <laughs> I mean, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And that's a quite a kind of interesting because I've, there, there's always been, I felt with my work, um, a, a sense that I am producing, I've always felt that I'm producing a work of art here. And I've always been aware of that. Uh, and, and when in the introduction to the book, um, I think I make quite clear that, you know, this is not a 
kind of piece of scientific rhetoric in the sense that I'm not claiming that it's all 100% true um, or that, you know, people should believe it, but that it's a kind of a vision of reality rather than a scientific hypothesis or, you know, God forbid, a scientific theory. It's certainly not a scientific theory, even though it uses, you know, alien, sorry, information theory, but information theory is... Yeah, it's kind of the science and mathematics of information, if you like. Um, but I certainly wouldn't describe it as a scientific theory. Uh, it I is mean, it's, it's, um, it's in philosophy, we would call it really speculative metaphysics. Right. In other words, put forward yeah. a hypothesis yeah. um, which seeks to sort of explain symptoms down the line to sort of, uh, you know, best explanation to experience phenomena, something like that, yeah, I guess. Exactly, yeah. So that's, that's kind of what I'm... Um, I was going for really, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm quite upfront about that. This is why I wrote the introduction. The introduction wasn't actually in the first draft of the book, um, the first printing, actually, the kind of proof copies. So the introduction wasn't there, but I kind of felt that people would, you know, I didn't want to be labeled as, as someone who, who had kind of ideas above their station and that actually took themselves rather too seriously <laughs> um, and think, you know, had it all worked out. And that's, but then you start to sound a bit like a cult leader, um, you know, someone who thinks you know they've, they've got it all covered, and, and and that's certainly not what I'm, uh, no. what, what I was attempting to generate. I was attempting to generate a, primarily a work of art, but something that was rooted within solid, reasonably solid kind of science, so sort of scientific ideas, scientific principles, uh, but also you know obviously reaching into highly speculative territory at the same time. Uh, and, that's what makes it interesting, of course. You know, yeah. it's, it's, otherwise it's just an analysis, and no one would disagree with you. You know, and you wouldn't buy right. it, and, and uh, no one would really buy your book. Well, not as many people because it's always right. interesting new new theory. And that's what I've always um, admired about you, really. Um, just the originality. I mean, I think you know when I saw your talk at BC years ago, I thought, wow. I mean, this is totally crazy, but at the same time, really, really interesting. And uh, maybe th there's some truth in it. Well, that's um, it. Yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've, sometimes I refer to my work as kind of very hard science fiction in, in that it's like, it's, um, it's indistinguishable from science, you know? Um, so, yeah. Well, you know, there's a, there's a cliche, isn't there, that, that somewhat is originally science fiction becomes science fact later on. Exactly. Typical example, actually, I was, so I'm also in interested in uh, n-dimensional hyperspace, you know, like yeah. more than three dimensions of space. And um, um, if you, if uh, you and uh, listeners know about Minkowski space, you know, which Einstein um, mm. sort of um, uh, adopted, Minkowski was Einstein's teacher, Minkowski, of course, yeah. time is the fourth spatial dimension. Yeah. It's interesting to note that H.G. Uh, Wells wrote about that, you know, uh, you know, in 1895, decades before Minkowski, or a decade before Minkowski sort of made it into wow. a, precise mathematical formula, you know, so a lot of people, so, uh, you know, often, you know, mathematicians before, like Riemann and so on, they, they were speculating that, you know, these, these extra dimensions of space are mathematically possible, mm. um, but it took, you know, uh, half a century or more for it to become sort of a phys phys physicist uh, or an idea in physics. So, you know, so, so perhaps, you know, as time goes on, we discover more, uh, which will yeah, yeah. the theory, perhaps. Perhaps, but, yeah. Perhaps yeah. not. Perhaps. Um, so, so let's get back, let's get to your first. Uh, our, I think first, and I really well. There's two main disagreements. I think the first are yeah, the information idea and the consciousness idea. But maybe I've misinterpreted you in the second ones, which makes the first idea the most important. Then, as yes. a point, point of disagreement. So, information. So, essentially, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying that at the fundamental level of reality, mm -hmm. there is information, yes. uh, the code, uh, yes. which codifies that information, and then the other, which is a sort of alien god, something like this. Yeah. That's another point we can talk about as well, yeah, yeah. sort of the parallels with religion. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. That's, that's more uh, sociological rather than a uh, logical point. Yeah. But anyway, okay, so information. Um, I disagreed with you because I thought you took um, certain quantitative measures mm. Um, of of real, I'm going to use that word, yeah. uh, carefully, uh, objects as, the, as it were, the real object itself. Yeah, I understand. So I think that information must be of something, yes. and it must inform somebody, very basically. I think I've, yes. I've got four or five more points in the review. Um, 
So how, how would you come back on that? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the, the, the clearest example you gave was uh, one could define a person by numbers representing their height, weight, age, and IQ. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously that set of numbers would not be the person. And I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, but when it comes to, so, so the point you dispute, the example that I give here is the example of an electron. Um, having a, a set of quantum numbers that can exist in, in finite states, in a finite number of states, discrete states, um, and that these numbers are essentially this information is the electron and it's nothing else. Mm. Now, <laughs> this is kind of a, this is my position on this, that actually the information is the electron. Um, and, and, uh, and also the, the way that this information interacts with other pieces of information which is defined as the, the rules, if you like, the rules of engagement, right? The laws of quantum physics, if you like, you know, the electro, you know, dynamics and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that the electron is actually just uh, information. And now, the reason I say this is, let's say, for example, um, we take it as granted that the electron cannot have any other properties other than these four quantum numbers. Um, so then if you take, let's say, another particle, uh, we'll call it the uh, you know, electron B or something, anything else, that, but it's not an electron, the non-electron. Um, and then we say that this non-electron also has you know, the, these four quantum numbers, um, and yet they're different. Um, then we have to say, well, then, then there must be some other property that differentiates them, right? So if, if particle A has these four quantum numbers and particle B has these four quantum numbers, but we're saying um, they're only defined by these four quantum numbers, that's patently false because otherwise they are the same. And thus there must be some other property. By, Leib by Leibniz's law, yeah. Right. Right. Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Entity of indiscernibles. <laughs> right. Uh, and so, so this is a kind of, this is not necessarily the most accepted and mainstream view of, of physics, but this comes from mathematicalism, which is Max Tegmark's position, which is that actually the electron is literally nothing other than that information. You know, it, it's a, it's a, the, the electron is a mathematical object. And actually, there's a quote from Tegmark in the book at that page. He's saying that the, the electrons um, are purely mathematical object in the sense that they have, they have no other properties other than their, their quantum numbers. Um, but so let, me, let me stop you there then. So, so I quoted Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, again, yeah. against that in a way. And I said, hmm. I mean, I'd say this. Two things, really. Number one, um, <clears throat> how do we know that those, number, those numbers then represent for an electron, for example, properties of that electron? I know you're disagreeing with hmm. that, really, but they represent properties um, which we can measure, which yes. we humans know, right? Yes. Number one, how do we know that that is all there is to an electron? I mean, you know, as you know, science advances all the time. Sure. And we gain new properties. I mean, elect an electron was, you know, the, the actual... Um, discovery of it, as it were, or the coining of the term was 19th century. It was pre-quantum mechanics. You know? Sure. So obviously, even the concept of an electron has evolved as science has mm. has changed. So how do we know that? Number one, those four um, quantum numbers, types of quantum number, are um, all there is to an electron. Secondly, mm. how do we know, as Russell said, then that there is not more to an electron or any particle for that matter or anything than yeah. that which we can know about it. Yeah. So, for example, like with a human being, we could get um, a number of different readings from a human being, like the four I gave, you know, weight, height, IQ, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, you know, in theory, you could measure everything about a human being um, according to our instruments, um, but yet you would still be missing something, of course. Yes. And that would be the sort of subjectivity of the person, you know, the emotions, right. the colours which are not quantitative, but qualitative. And of course it is, it happens to be Russell and Eddington, who I quote as well, their view is that there's a certain um, basic form of mentality within particles themselves. Yes. Now we're getting into my strange theory. Yes. Of the and so I kid some, yeah. Um, but they're in interestingly related here because, um, you know, the view then is that um, what we can know of something is never the full concrete extent of that object. Mm. The information we can gain about something is never fully sufficient to describe the full thing. 
And yes. when, and like, so my criticism really is this, that when we talk about um, the informational values of an electron or whatever it may be, uh, we're only abstracting, you know, certain parts of it and we're not fully describing it. Therefore, I would say that the concrete reality is not uh, the information about an electron, but it's sort of a mysterious object, but there's the electron in itself. As it yes, I mean... I mean, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you, but I think when you, when you adopt a particular model or a particular, um, a particular paradigm um, or worldview, if you like, within, within physics, then you, can, you use that. Um, and so I don't disagree with you in, that you, you might be correct and that there might be some, you know, some fundamental electronness that we can never know about, you know, uh, that there, there's some experience perhaps to the electron. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but um, um, it's about finding, you know, there are, there are a number of um, reasonably kind of mainstream coherent models of physics, if you like, um, that, that describe describe what's, you know, what's going on. And then from there you have to say, well, you know, what, you know, what, what puts it all together? What is it, what is sits behind all of it? And, and the different models would, would come up with different things. And one of, you know, the one that I chose and I did select it, uh, was this mathematicalism, uh, because yeah. it, because it allows me then to say things like the electron is nothing more than the information instantiated by its quantum numbers. And I can say that, uh, because that's, you know, that's what I've chosen. Now, if I had chosen to talk about string theory or, um, you know, something very, very different, I would have taken a different position. And, okay, and so, so, so on the assumption of what we know about physics, quantum physics um, today, then you're sort of saying, uh, if we assume that, then hmm. uh, what are the consequences of that? Or what could the consequences be? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it's even... It's, it's even stronger than that. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just saying, you know, what we know about physics. It's actually taking, actually, it's rather um, fringe. I mean, digital physics is not, it's, it's kind of, it's not mainstream. Um, and, and so, you know, there's... It's supposed to be even less so, you know. Yeah, exactly. So it's something that I have adopted specifically because it allows me to create this narrative. Um, and so, you know, and, and I know that that is... Deli that is kind of selection bias of, of the highest order in that I am sp specifically choosing a model that allows me to, to create this narrative. But that's, that's part of what I'm doing here. And I'm, I'm quite open about that. And I am generating a vision. I am creating a narrative. I'm saying the world could be like this. You know, the world is very fucking strange. Um, and DMT is, you know, stranger than we can, can imagine, stranger than we can suppose. Um, and, um, in there, in there, right? yeah, yeah, always. <laughs> and so, you know, what is, uh, you know, what, what is a kind of, kind of coherent, cogent narrative that I can put together that kind of makes people think, wow, the world could be like this. I'd never imagined that it could be like this. And this seems to be a, seems to be coherent. Um, could it be something like this? So, you know, I'm quite open. And then, of course, fact. all scientific theories have to make assumptions as well. So, you're of sort course, of, yeah. in that sense, you're, you're equal. But at the same time, you're not really disagreeing with my critique. No, exactly, I'm not. Um, you know, you, you, this is just a, you have has a different kind of um, uh, starting point. Yeah, yeah, a different starting point. And and I think when you when you bring consciousness into it, then I, I think uh, this is why actually. I mean, we, we're slightly jumping ahead here, but this is why actually the issue of consciousness is. Is is skirted over a little, quite a lot in the book. I, I deliberately don't get into that because I know that it's a fucking minefield, and that um, that although I do have ideas about what could be going on, um, I but interestingly, to... yeah, so I think that it it relates very well. I mean, so the assumption, in a way, your assumption is that a particle doesn't have any form of sentience at all. I prefer sentience to consciousness. Because it, it kind of includes the subconscious, basic drives, and so on, right? Um, and and then a later critique of mine is just, I mean, I'm generally crit critical of uh, emergentism, you know, very broadly, which means, you know, that yeah, might yeah, emerge yeah, yeah. from the brain, right? Or, or, or whatever, or a computer, or whatever it may be. Um, but the reason I'm critical of it, and sort of was, in a way, in towards your book, is because... Um, of this impasse you get when you think when you you uh, refuse any sentience to uh, you know fundamental reality mm. you give them only a sort of mechanical or numerical explanation and then you know later on you think okay we've sort of we, we understood sort of you know biology mechanically 
and we can use it for technology, medicine, weapons, whatever. But then we've reached this impasse, then, as you sort of alluded to, which is yeah. you know, commonly today called the high problem of consciousness, but it was called yes. mind matter problem before that, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. It's got many names. Uh, Leibniz's mill, even, is really essentially the same thing. Um, so, <clears throat> if you, in other words, um, I, said, I, said, I think my criticism was like um, inf- how matter creates or is mind mm. is real mystery. Yes, and hard to, hard to explain, but that information, even further down than matter, could produce mind as it would be even more of a mystery. How numbers essentially, or not numbers, yes. but values, values, yes, qualia, you know, or like experience, or colors, or emotions, feelings, uh, thoughts, calculations, whatever. Um, well, the calculations not so much, but um, certainly emotions is a real mystery. Um, but then you said that I might have misinterpreted that. I think I put in the footnote that I wasn't sure whether you were really a, a, sort of positing an emergentism or an identity theory, by which I mean this. So, uh, you know, in the mid 20th century, identity, psychoneural identity theory was like you know, very popular, which is that the mind or the mental states, emotions, colors, whatever, essentially are, literally are yeah. neural patterns, let's say, to be broad. Right? Mm. Uh, that was sort of uh, dismissed by something called the multiple realization criticism, which is that if we say, for example, this is from Hilary Putnam, you know, um, uh, an octopus, if we say that hunger is a certain pattern in the human brain, uh, then we would deny that to an octopus, for example. You know, it's yeah. deny hunger to an octopus because it hasn't got a human brain. So therefore this identity uh, didn't really hold. And thus you got emergent functionalism, first of all, and emergentism and a host of other theories. Um, so I wasn't sure whether you were saying that information at a higher level was the same thing as subjectivity or whether it produced subjectivity or whether I've completely misunderstood it. So perhaps you could... Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm certainly not the first to connect information with consciousness. Um, I mean, if you, obviously you know about Giulio Tononi and, and integrated information. And I mean, that is a form of panpsychism in itself. It's sort of well, I think we would disagree with that, but I think... <laughs> well, I, remember, I know Christoph Koch said in his uh, sort of uh, autobiography, he said, uh, I finally come to the realization that I am a panpsychist. Yeah. Tononi, perhaps not, but... Um, mm, I mean, the issue is that, I mean, s- certainly what Tononi posits is that consciousness is fundamental. Um, but he, but he's very clear about what things do and don't contain consciousness, or sorry, which systems are and are not conscious, and those that are have zero uh, integrated information are, are have zero consciousness, and those that so it's so so I, um, whether that fits with panpsychism, I'm not sure. I mean, that's, I mean, there's very various strands of panpsychism. I mean, it does fit with ver- some. You know, you have to have um, you have to make differentiation between aggregates and uh, holons for you know. Mm which is simply this, that, and Bruno made this distinction, you know, 500 years ago, um, that uh, we don't say that clothing, pieces of clothing are conscious because they're not aggregates. Uh, they're not, they're not y- unities, rather, or holons. Um, they are aggregates. So, you know, from, from how psychism was coined in the Renaissance by Petrizzi, and from the very start, it's always held this um, distinction between aggregates and holons. Now, what is a holon, then? It's some kind of integrated mechanism um, I wouldn't say information, but some kind of integrated uh, system, you know, like uh, similar to autopoiesis, something like this. But yeah, it's yeah. a big question in panpsychism, you know, how, how do you actually, uh, how do you, what is the criterion for that? It's a very, very tricky question. But, yeah. the, but my point is that um, int- integrated information theory is certainly compatible with certain types of panpsychism, but the problem is, again, information uh, and how they understand that themselves. But we're, 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 we're deviating a bit. Um, yes. But I think, the, the, I guess the key point about integrated information theory is that it's an identity theory um, in, that, in that integrated information is consciousness according to Tononi. Um, so it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't emerge from information, but actually the integrated information is consciousness. Um, um, and he's, he's very clear about that. Um, <laughs> but I mean, this, uh, immediately this is uh, very problematic, of course, <laughs> because of the, you know, the properties of like an emotion um, and properties of information pers- in its, uh, its raw form, of course, seem to be incommensurable, you know? Yes. But, 
But okay, if you say they are commensurable, then you've got an identity theory. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that what you're proposing as well? Isn't it? Well, no, but, but uh, no. Well, uh, you can tell me whether that's what I'm proposing. <laughs> but um, so, yeah. I mean, I'm. I, I if you asked me what was my actual kind of position on conscious, I mean, I, 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 I guess you would. I'm, I'm almost. I'm kind of an idealist in a sense that I, I think that I think of. Um, the world and the universe is being structured, I think, fundamentally at the ground of reality. Now, I, I, in the book, I talk about information. Um, but what I don't do, and, and this is something actually that forms part of your critique, is, is you, you, uh, you say that information must always be about something. Um, now, I would put it slightly differently and say that there must, information must always be instantiated. So it's like uh, I, I describe information as being when, when a system can choose between a finite number of states. Um, now you can say, well, what are those states, or what is what is it that's existing in those states? Um, so, For so, example, you, you use the uh, the coin example as the basic yeah. system, right? So it can be heads or tails, heads or tails, yeah. or a binary digits yeah. zero one. You've got the basis, the, the substratum, as it were, or the substance, or where that word comes from, which is the metal. Yeah, it's right. Metal, right. Exactly. So, so, so information is instantiated by some kind of thing, right? Um, now, there might be a ways around that mathematically, or some, you know, people might say, well, you don't need that. You just need an abstract object um, that doesn't, that only, only exists in an abstract sense. And that is what Tegmark might say. Um, but I'm, I, I don't dismiss the idea that actually there's some, when I say the ground of reality is pure information. I mean, I don't necessarily dismiss the idea that the ground of reality has something that instantiates that information. Now, it could be, you know, if we take a sort of pure sort of matrix approach, it could be ones and zeros, right, um, that does that in, in some kind of alien computer. That's one thing. But, okay, but for an to that, then, what would, what would that alien computer be, as it were? Because it, wouldn't, it couldn't be information because it's a sort of substratum of information itself, right? Yeah. Well, exactly. But that's what I mean. So that's why I don't agree. I don't think that's the case, by the way. But that would be one way of doing it, right? You could say, okay, these, the, the, you know, the, the fundamental digits of our reality are, are produced by an alien computer of unknown form. And, and even Ed, Ed Fredkin, who's one of the, f the founders of digital physics, um, calls this place the other, because he accepts that the computer that's running our reality uh, may be running in ways that we, we, we can't, maybe, you know, its structure and the way that it computes and all these kind of things may be completely different. You know, the, the physics of that place may be completely different to ours. We can't make assumptions about what is and isn't possible, first of all. That's a really important point. Um, but I don't subscribe to the idea that it's an alien computer. Um, but I think perhaps, again, if we want to bring in consciousness here, um, the idea that fundamental consciousness in some way can instantiate information in the same in, in the way like um are you familiar with uh, josiah royce yeah no, he's a panpsychist yeah. is it maybe a panpsych i thought it was an idealist but anyway. well there's a thin line i mean schopenhauer is a bit of sort of, you know, <laughs> well, of schopenhauer he's a kantian turned panpsychist okay but anyway so so royce i, I was reading an essay recently uh, royce's model of the absolute uh, where it describes this idea that you know, the absolute self, fundamental consciousness, um, has um, is only aware of itself. Uh, but it's not only aware of itself; it's also aware that it's aware of itself. And you see, you get this recursive function. And from this, you can generate um, uh, you can generate basically like um, you can generate the, na the natural numbers, for example. You know, using these this kind of recursive function. And the natural numbers you can match the natural numbers to create all possible computable functions. In other words. Using simple awareness of awareness of awareness of awareness, you can actually create, you can actually compute. And, and so you know, this idea that there might be at the ground of reality some kind of fundamental consciousness that you, know, you might think of as awake and unawake would be one way you know, uh, to think about it, uh, on or off, you know, black or white. It's the same idea, um, the idea that the ground of reality is this, this thing that may be consciousness that flips and uses that property of itself self-awareness in order to compute and that 
So it's like the universe is a self-computing consciousness that is instantiated in some way using this 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 code. I mean, it, 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 you know, I mean that, that adds a whole new element to the <laughs> cosmology, doesn't it? Really, yeah. I mean, that just goes one deeper still. That's one why that's still. why I don't discuss it. You see, because first of all, I'm not. I don't have a what I would consider to be a coherent idea on this. These are just kind of musings and ideas and, and what I've thought about. Uh, you know, and, I, and when you listen to someone like Alan Watts saying it's all pulse, it's all on and off. You know, black and white, white. You know, back and back and front. Um, and you think, yeah, you know, the universe, the worlds appear and they disappear. It, it's all a cycle. And if you think maybe at the ground of it all, you know, the fundamental self, the fundamental consciousness, the absolute self, is is switch using a kind of a switching between being awake and asleep. Um, in order to generate that fundamental information from which, you know, it kind of complexifies and forms these these little um, complexes of consciousness Mm. that we recognize as, you know, self-reflective complexes or, you know, conscious brains, you know. But ultimately, it's all about organization of consciousness. Okay, I mean, mean, you're getting into pantheism or panentheism or panpsychism there. We're we're gradually (laughs) coming to agreement here, but... Um, would you say that brains are necessary and sufficient for consciousness? Or would you say that like sentience, <clears throat> like some, something akin to subconsciousness, is possible at lower levels? I, I think, I think so, level. yeah. I like think, um, muscle or something like this. I mean, mm. some sea creature or... I think, I, 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 I'm, uh, you know, I think consciousness is a, um, just like life is not a, um, it's not, a property of matter it's an organization it's it's the organization of things it's the way things are interacting it's the the way the information flows through the system that's what defines some, whether something is living or non-living for example um it's kind of substrate independent and i think brains are particularly good at um forming this knot almost like this kind of self-reflective knot um, that, 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 that seems to amplify, you know, like, you know, like a, that's how I imagine it, like the, the sound box of a guitar, that when you get, when the structure is just right, or a Stradivarius violin, when the structure is just right, it kind of self amplifies and self, you know, that self organization and complexity self amplifies. And you get this is when you get this focus of, you know, very, yes. very intense well, consciousness. With a violin, um, you know, you can still make a noise by like, uh, smacking it or something but of course right. the violin itself just as you say amplifies that yeah Fechner, um who was a sort of panpsychist and pantheist he, he he's got this great analogy with um um consciousness and uh, stringed instruments he says you know like um every time we have a stringed instrument that makes it you makes a sound and or combined it makes music and, but um so we think that stringed instruments are necessary for making lovely music and with sounds but then one hears a flute and my real editor says, ah, okay, so this falsifies the whole doctrine. Yes. You could say, you know, analogously then with um, consciousness in the brain, you know, like <clears throat> we are aware of our own uh, consciousness and uh, we are aware that we have brains and we are aware that they are correlated, although that correlation is not uh, complete, of course, but it's assumed to be there. Um, but does that necessarily, that doesn't, that by itself, of course, doesn't mean that brains are necessary uh, for consciousness. I mean, you could have, I mean, integrated information theory is exactly that, of course. You know, yep. it's, it's that, just that the brain's very good at integrating information, but exactly. um, so could a plant be, you know, at a lower level. Um, yes. But of course, in your book, you say brains, don't you? You sort of emphasize the fact that, and that's yes. your field. Yes. Um, but you emphasize that, you know, the, the, uh, the grid creates brains, or brains emerge from the grid eventually, mm-hmm. like a game of life, and then, then consciousness, are, well, here you have to be careful with words. Consciousness yeah. then emerges from that, or rises, or is manifest through that. I don't think I ever say that. I don't think I ever say consciousness emerges in that way. But maybe uh, you don't say you say manifests and generates. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I'm very careful about what I use, and 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 I definitely can understand why you would why you know a person of of, of your academic background would, would say, ah, he's, this is an emergentism, you know, I must strike this down. Uh, but actually, <laughs> I'm very aware of that, you know, and, and I'm s- yeah, very aware of the problems with emergentism, and, and that's why But it's, the problem is, is trying to create a, you know, why, why do I focus on brains? Well, because brains do something particular. They, they, they are the structure, not only that um, 
we assume is necessary for our consciousness, our personal consciousness, but actually uh, is responsible for, for generating this, the, the informational structure of our phenomenal world. Uh, that's, the, that's why I focus on brains. So, you know, I, I choose brains as, as a particular example of something uh, mm. that, that's important for the narrative, you know, the idea of, that the brain is building worlds. And, and, of course, that's why I focus on the brain. But I certainly at no point do I say brains are necessary and sufficient yeah, for consciousness yeah, right. that, was um, my reading. that would be that would be part of a broader discussion i think but but here i i'm using brain the consciousness of them is actually secondary you know i i i talk about the fact that brains use information from the environment to to generate a, 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 a basically a structure an informational stru- a pattern of information that is experienced then as your phenomenal world from from within which is i guess is you know for, uh, Coming after Teilhard de Chardin, right? You know the the, the within of things, uh, and the idea that you know this information is literally uh, experienced from within is your phenomenal world. Uh, but I'm I'm quite I'm quite aware there that I'm there's some kind of an explanatory gap that I'm leaving, kind of gaping uh, <laughs> in the why, why 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 does this information generate the brain? Why is it experienced from a from the within? Uh, I'm just making well, this is a mystery. Yeah, it is a great mystery. Nobody knows the answer to this, of course. Nobody knows the answer. Emergentism yeah. is the, the sort of default position today in science and really philosophy as well, generally speaking. So, mm. um, but um, here's I, I said in the critique as well as uh, I would have liked to see more exploration of this particular question now, which is the following um, You say that you make a distinction between you know, waking consciousness, a view of everything now, and dreams. And yeah. uh, we say that waking consciousness is veridical, which is a useful word. It means real yeah. um, and of an, ob- uh, an object of existence, not mind, yeah. which is mind uh, independent, or at least yes. independent of your own mind. Hmm. Um, and then whereas a dream is dependent on your own mind, right? Yes. So it's, it's not out there for others, presumably. You know, because, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Um, now, so you make that point because you want to say that um, we don't need uh, senses to experience, um, you know, other worlds as a work. Yeah. Then how do you? How do you? I mean, a very. I can imagine someone coming along and saying, "Listen, how, you know, the DMT experience is just like a dream. It's just like a radical dream. You know, you, it looks real, just like a dream can look real, mm. but it's not. It's just um, completely subjective, mind dependent. But you are saying it's not mind dependent." It's actually, um, it shows you another objective reality, as it were. Okay. So how would, you, how would you respond to that? Well, I would, I would dispute objective for a start, but anyway. <laughs> and I never, <laughs> so, so basically, yes, a, a dream is, uh, it's not entirely independent. If you actually think across the different temporal scales, you think about uh, you know, a, a dream is, whilst you're having the dream, it, it's, it's, it's independent of sensory information. Uh, but it's not entirely independent of, of the normal waking world because the dream world tends to be, uh, this is the, the continuity hypothesis of dreaming, which states that dreaming is continuous with waking. So the world you experience during a dream is actually the same world as you experience during waking. Uh, and that's been shown to be actually the case. Um, and it's, what do you and, mean the same world exactly? You mean well, the and, and, of- yes, so the structure of the world, the way that it's constructed by the brain is the same. And, and you can actually ask people to, um, um, like people are experienced dreamers uh, who can recall their dreams in great detail. And, and a lot of phenomenological work has been done on this and actually look, asking people, you know, ha- measuring ha- the proportion of time people spend talking on the telephone or watching TV in the dream state, right? And it's, it's the same proportion of time as they do during the waking life. Um, suggesting, um, uh, uh, and, you know, all the senses are intact normally in a normal way. Now, now the dream world is... Um, kind of different that it can become more erratic and more fluid because it isn't constrained by sensory data as much but the, the brain is constructing the same model you know the brain has an internal generative model of the world that it uses um constantly uh, and, and, it, and it's using it's sampling data basically to test that model um and it will refine the model on the fly uh, I, know, I, know that's a common, I know that's a popular theory today yeah. but is that really I wonder, I mean, like, for example, if you're watching a movie that you've never seen before, yeah. it's not like your mind, your brain is producing that movie. It's, it's completely novel, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is I mean, producing it. Yeah, it's producing it. It's producing it, um, uh, but uh, uh, during runtime, so to speak. It's, it's like it doesn't have a model of that film. Okay, but it's not it's not a sufficient cause of of uh, your viewing of the film. I mean, the film itself is uh, part of the cause, and your brain then yeah. is another part of the cause. Yes, yes, uh, which yes, means yes. that it, it would be wrong to say that your brain uh, creates a reality you see around you. It's really um, interpreting the world around you according, okay, according to what it expects. But yes. nonetheless, there's a lot of novelty that comes in all the time. I mean, yes, absolutely, and and that novelty is is for, you know that that novelty creates these these prediction errors basically, which are which are which uh, are pe- feed forward to the higher parts of the brain that are actually are creating this model. I mean, this is this is one particular way of. I mean, this is it is this is called predictive uh, predictive coding and predictive processing. Basically, it's mm. a way of thinking about, and and it's it's very very well supported by the way. Uh, but but you don't have to support that particular specific idea. But certainly, the brain is constructing the information that the the information that constitutes your phenomenal world is is constructed by the brain. Uh, now, whether it's constructing it using this particular kind of top-down approach or using a model, or whether it's you know receiving information in a kind of bottom-up a sense, kind of feature detection, all that kind of stuff, it doesn't matter. Um, but the, the, the fact is that the information that it's that your, you experience as your phenomenal world is always being generated by your brain. Um, now, um, if you go to sleep at night, um, that information is cut off. The, the sensory information is cut off, uh, and yet the brain continues to build a world that is, you know, almost indistinguishable. And in many ways, it is indistinguishable. Now, Not my dream, but I, often, yes. Yeah, often, yeah. And of course, there are exceptions to this, um, but generally, that's that seems to be the case. Now, if you, I mean, there's often a narrative, isn't there, in dreams? Like I walked along a pavement and then I went up into a helicopter or something like this. Yes, you don't get so much with uh, psychedelics and images. Uh, that's true. Yeah, um, but you know, it's the it, the, the narrative might well be constructed later of course when you wake up when you can recall the dream uh, <laughs> plus of course there are lucid dreams where you're conscious that you're in a dream which is yes. again, more similar to reality in a way exactly less similar, depending on your yeah. perspective but anyway continue yeah. sir yes yeah, so so you're so that you know the, the dream state is is informed by the waking state you know if you, if you if i dreamt about this movie you were talking about before i'd watched it then that would be uh, that would be pretty amazing um if i could describe you know everything in the detail um what the movie was about and the plot lines and the acts and all that stuff and the, you know the twist at the end then that would be insane uh, but of course if i'd watched the movie the night before Okay, fair enough. You know, it's, it's a particularly striking film. Then I might dream about it. But of course, you always dream about things that that come from the model that your brain has, con- has learned to construct, essentially. So, 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 yes. At the time when you're dreaming, to come to the final point, the conclusion there uh, is that yes, the dream is independent at the time of its sensory information, but it's certainly dependent upon having had, um, you know years and years, decades of experience in the normal world. So this is where it becomes interesting. Because then you say, well, okay, we know that, we know why we experience a particular structure of dreams is because the brain has learned to construct this model of reality. And then you introduce DMT and suddenly the brain starts being able to suddenly switching. You know, I talk about the switching from English to fluent Siberian Yupik, you know, having never been even aware that that language existed, as most people won't be, um, and, and suddenly being able to speak it fluently. And that's kind of what, the way, what I see the brain doing, is it has this model of reality that it's learned to construct over decades and really over evolutionary epochs. Um, and... Um, Suddenly, it starts. It switches and starts building this 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 precise, crystalline, um, clear, you know, uh, alternate hyperdimensional reality, replete with this this panoply of, of intelligent beings. You know, so I see that as a great mystery. Yeah, no, that is a great mystery and profound, really. And yeah. Why why you just don't get complete chaos? You know, it's just there's the mystery, isn't it? And why you, you see things which are completely unrelated to your life, really. That's it. Part of that mystery. Because so um, you dream often are, you know, like a, mm. you know, many people's dreams are often about, you know, office time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but why, why, why do you think that then? So the brain, again, the main point here, the brain creates dreams, creates scare quotes. Um, why does it not create the DMT world? Why is that veridical? Mm. I mean, Good question. Yeah. So you're saying why? Why not? So is the if the dream is the counterpart to waking reality, the DMT dream would be the counterpart to the DMT reality. 
Um, no, I'm saying, you know, DMT experience, like a dream could be just a counterpart, well, not a counterpart, just another form of um, non-veridical experience, you know, like a, like a yes. hallucination. Yes, of course, but the, the, that you don't get around that. You're faced with the problem of, of understanding why the brain is able to construct, because the brain must always construct the reality that you're experiencing. And how does the brain know? Um, you know, if it was just chaos that, that DMT generated, why would it, the brain try and interpret that or restructure it or organize that into this very, very highly characteristic alternate reality that, that you know, that is highly characteristic, you know, across, ma- you know, many hundreds of thousands of years uh, and, and, but, but, and, and has these very specific properties that we know as being DMT-esque. Why would it do that? Mm. That's the issue. You see. We know I mean, that's how, yeah, that's how people distinguish generally dreams from, um, you know, waking con- common consensus reality, which is that the regularity of that consensus reality, you know, it's, um, you know, it's always the same, chairs always in the same place, sky's always blue and so on and so forth. In the same yeah. DMT world, as, whereas the dream is very fluid, as you say. Yes, Doesn't the dream is very fluid, but the dream is always, you know, we know why your dream world is structured as it is, because we know that it's, it's, it's based upon the model the brain uses for the real world. So the brain had to have the informational input, sensory mm. input from, mm. from the normal waking world, so to speak, the environment, in order to be able to construct the dream world. So then this then raises the question as to why, um, I always said begs the question now, oh, you yeah, make that. <laughs> I wasn't going <laughs> to. my coach. Yeah. Just to test you, yeah. Um, it raises the question as to how the brain knows or learned essentially uh, as i normally describe how did the brain learn to construct this dmt reality without having had some kind of sensory input from that space so that's that's kind of always the jumping off point for me is, is why why we know how the brain learns to construct worlds uh, to a some to a reasonable extent so why how did the brain learn to construct the dmt world and that is very difficult to explain unless you posit some kind of extrinsic data source, which would be interface with this orthogonal reality, which is experienced as the DMT space. But always, you know, even when you're in the DMT space, you're always um, experiencing a world constructed by your brain. That applies even when you're in the DMT space. So in a sense, all worlds are, all worlds are subjective. All phenomenal worlds are subjective by definition. They're all constructed by... Um, the brain. So the question is, is, is there, is it being modulated by information from outside? As we know, the normal waking world is it's being modulated by sensory information. Is there a, the, this counterpart DMT world sensory information that's, that's modulating and, and constraining the world that my brain constructs under the influence of DMT? So what you're essentially saying is that, you know, every, every, re- every reality we experience is a representation as it were. Yes. And, um, a dream doesn't represent anything outside of your mind. Waking experience does represent something which is which is modified by outside the world, mm. like um, some kind of reality. Although we don't know necessarily know that it's the same as what how we see it. Of course, so, you know the idealism yeah. and exactly. DMT is just another reality um, which we can't perceive, we can't see or touch um, with our senses, at least. But nonetheless, you, as you claim in the book, um, there are other means by which uh, the information flows in to our mind. Here's yeah. an inter- re- related to that, though. You know, Bertrand Russell again and others have said, the real test of reality is touch. Yeah. How do I know that this cup is real? <laughs> well, I can see it. If my friend said, I don't see the cup, mm-hmm. I could touch it, you know, to sort of uh, to, to double check, as it were. And it seems to me that a lot of, a lot of uh, psychedelic experiences are very visual-based, especially DMT. Is there, in your experience, a tactile um, element to the DMT experience as well? I mean... It's an interesting question. Substantiate, corroborate that mm. objective reality. Um, people do describe things happening to them. I mean, there's, like, there's a famous... Um, uh, in Peter Meyer's um, set of you know 300 plus or whatever it is entity experiences, there are, n- are many cases where people describe having things happen to them, like being you know fucked by reptilians. Now I can't imagine that was in the Strassman book, wasn't it? <laughs> was it? Was it? Yeah, it could be fucked them in eighty. That was the worst trip ever. Just <laughs> yeah. People to yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, that was quite tactile, then I guess. Uh, I mean, how? I mean. Th- uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine, be, you know, uh, how you would experience that without um, that being some kind of tactile element. That unless, so, as you said, with dreams, 
upon memory, upon recall, you sort of say, well, yeah, I was, you know, you attached yeah. and so on. But at the time, perhaps yeah. the sensation wasn't as solid. But I mean, this is a, this is an interesting uh, area for exploration for mm. phenomenologists, you know, sort of DMT. Yeah. Like that, to really go in there and investigate how it compares <laughs> with general touch. Yeah, I think so. And um, of course, touch itself is as much a sense you know the, the sense of touch is is as much constructed by by your brain as is the sense of the visual senses and the uh, you know the, the auditory senses in that you know that that sense you have is um the feeling you get if when you touch something is is also generated so you know if you were in a, a simulation for example you know um the the check the tables would still resist you you know you still feel them it would even though of course they wouldn't be there in a sense uh, and in a dream of course you experience touch um you know it's not like that the sense of touch is gone in a dream you know you you can pick up things you can sit down these might be altered slightly but uh yeah you experience touch in a dream yeah it's a very interesting question i mean i i think about my own dreams i don't really ever think about touch no, yeah, that's another question. But, um, but you've never noticed your hand going through things. I mean, you know, you you interact with people. You do things in dreams. You might be playing football, or you might be, you know, driving a car. I mean, I've been driving a car, and I've never again. Yeah, unless you focus on something, you don't. But of course, take for granted. Regardless of that, a reality doesn't need to be tactile anyway. Something can exist without, um, you know, having any tactile solid properties. Course, for example, yeah. if you. If you're a universalist, you believe like numbers exist in this sort of platonic realm or something yes, like this. Right. They're not tactile. You can touch them, yeah. So on, we couldn't, we would say exist, but not yeah. tactile. Arguably time is uh, not tactile, but is existent nonetheless and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Space yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Space itself is, uh, well, Precisely. Yeah, exactly. So, so I don't think we need to assume that the DMT world has to exhibit um, touchability <laughs> in order to be, in order to but, be extant. But that's an interesting question then. So there's a re there could be a reality um, orthogonal to our reality, a right angle to our three dimensions, as you say, um, that need not be so, uh, material, but essentially or solid, tactile in any way, mm. haptic, um, but yet could be real. So then the question is, well, what do we mean by real? Mm. I would suggest this. If there are other sentiences out there, in other words, with their own perspective and their own experience, then, um, that would be a reality. Yes. You know, whether, whether they were tactile or not. And that is the real question. That's the interesting question with a lot of psychedelic experiences. You meet an alien or a devil or whatever. Mm. And at the time, quite often you think these, are, these have their own points of view, just as you think with people and animals. Um, but the real question is, do they? How could we prove it in any way? But then, of course, you re you know you've got the old problem of other minds. You can't yeah, really yeah. prove other humans mm. have got sentience. You just assume it because you're a human. You have it. You assume it with mammals, but of course, it's very uh, loose criteria criterion because you know how far down do you go? I mean, do you include birds? Do you include um, you know uh, fish, amoebas, yeah. mm -hmm. plants, yeah. molecules, and so on? Yeah, and and this is this is also the way I see it as well. And uh, Giulio Tononi uh, says that you know if something has its own perspective, then it's it's really real. Um, so to distinguish so liveness you know, as well, of course, you know. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. All right. In indication of reality, your own yeah. perspective. Yeah, and I I, that, I think so. I think that's the only um, seems the most sensible way of, of going about. Uh, defining the, the reality of a place is whether it uh, harbors conscious intelligences. You know, this is when I, when I was at breaking convention in 2015, my, um, um, my, my talk was called, what, what is it like to be a machine elf? Um, after, um, Nagel, of course. Right? <laughs> it was actually before Nagel with TLS Sprig, who was a nice artist. Okay. okay. Before that with a, uh, behaviorist from 1950. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. What is it like to be a machine elf? Yeah. Yeah. From, so, you know, so, yeah, yeah so that's your answer to that. Well, well, but I think most people don't really ever um, consider that idea, and and people talk right. about you know whether is is it real or is it not real or is it all in your head, and they throw around these kind of ideas without really really get defining their terms properly and thinking about what they actually mean by it. And so I think getting get trying to get into the head of a machine elf and think actually you know 
is a machine elf real or is it part of my own mind? It, one way of doing that is to say, well, does the machine elf have a perspective? You know, is when I'm looking at the machine elf, is he equally unable to deny his existence as much as I'm unable to deny my existence, basically, or my consciousness? That would be it. Yeah, and could that machine elf be simply your, like a real sentience, a real subjectivity, mm. yeah. but not in that particular form that, in which you represent him? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Because of course, you always have to interpret the information you're you're receiving and, and constructing uh, a model, really. Um, and your brain has to do that always. And so, the true nature yeah. of the machine elf, um, uh, you can't say, but you, you can understand perhaps why the brain might, when it's faced with a, a being that they seem to exhibit certain characteristics, why it might generate. Yeah. Yeah. Close exactly. To cheeky, exactly. Cheeky little uh, goblin. I right. mean, yeah. as you say, with uh, consensus reality, you know, the world we see around us is idealism really is just our, our particular human characteristic of it. You know, bees will see the world a different way. But the same yeah. then would apply to the DMT world. We would have to see that world in our own particular human way as well, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This one, but nonetheless, yeah. not necessarily in a veridical way. Yeah. Um, so the, the truth of it, the reality of it, as it were, is nominal, you to use Kant's words, is sort of... Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, it's to us. Yeah, exactly. So Why the problem is... And I know you and David Luke wrote a, an article about this once mm. about little elves, little people, lilli, li, Lilliputians, right? Yeah, yeah. Isn't it bizarre? And it's not just DMT. I mean, I've, I've had it on salvia and psilocybin and so on. Mm. It's very, you know, like inundated with these little goblins or dwarves or pixies or elves, whatever, right? Isn't that, I just find that a very fascinating phenomenon. It's very interesting to read your paper saying that it's pre-McKenna, you know, you sort yeah. of from, from the very beginning of these uh, recorded... Yeah. Modern Western psychedelic experiences, there have been these illusions sort of yeah. laughing about all the time. Mm. And then you look at folklore, of course, very common in folklore. I mean, like from I'm half Swedish, so I, I think about, you know, in the cosmology of the Vikings, you've got the sort of uh, dark elf realm, mm. the light elf realm that was sort of uh, influential in Lord of the Rings and so on. You know, and you, and then the question is, yeah, did, uh, did some kind of uh, experiences um, influence that religion or did the religion influence? as a part of Western legacy, influence our kind of um, interpretation of um, psychedelic experiences. Yeah. Again, it's um, a cause effect problem. Yeah, like a chicken and egg issue, right? Yeah, I, I agree. What, what's your view on that? I mean, you know, Aldous Huxley wrote Heaven and Hell, and he thought that religion essentially was based on you know, psychedelic experiences. Yeah, so you're, are you suggesting that um, the elves of, of folklore are the result of psychedelic experiences. Well, I'm not. I'm not suggesting it. I'm putting it <laughs> forward as an hypothesis. I don't suggest anything anymore. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I uh, it's, it's interesting to know that the Vikings did make use of hallucinogenic beers, apparently, mm. and they did. Um, they found um, Danish Viking witches, the Lure, as they called, in their mm -hmm. graves with uh, cannabis seeds, which they presumably smoked. So, you know, um, and then in ancient Greece, of course, you know, the wine there was pretty much psychoactive. I mean, it's very different from wine today, plus not to mention the Eleusinian mysteries and so on. So it seems mm -hmm. that uh, these, you know, you know, sort of mind-altering chemicals were used in ancient cultures. And we also noticed these Lilliputian li li in, in ancient cultures could be a causal relationship, could be coincidental, I don't know. But I just find it fascinating mm -hmm. that this is just so common. Uh, be, I agree, yeah. As well, could it be something to do with toys? Maybe, you know, you I mean, toys are generally Lilliputian, you know, mini versions of, of big things like dolls, whatever, and doll houses. Could yeah. I don't know. That well, I, I, I've suggested that, um, that these, uh, you know, I've suggested perhaps that, that DMT levels are actually higher in, in, in the fetus. Um, as they are in other animals, in the mammals as well, like rabbits and, and, and mice. Um, and that actually the fetal brain is in some way interacting with this, you know, it's basically undergoing this DMT experience for quite extended periods throughout uh, gestation. Um, and that the, the newborn, the infant, is actually much closer to the DMT space originally um, than certainly than an adult would be. Um, but that as DMT levels levels drop, uh, as they do, you know, a few days after birth in, in smaller animals, um, that the child becomes kind of cemented more in, into this kind of consensus reality. Uh, but the reason that you know these very small creatures are like you know I talk about the Teletubbies, right? Um, uh, these you know wildly popular 
uh, things that, that, that appeal to children and little things that running around giggling, giggling, giggling you know, like, uh, appeal to children. And, and often DMT experiences is, is often associated with childhood motifs. I mean, there's mm. fairgrounds, there's clowns, mm. um, you know, there's, there's little creatures running around. Uh, well, there's a slight horror element to all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's the, the, at least the, a mischievous element. A mischievous, a very dark kind of comic mm. uh, winking kind mm. of element to the whole thing. Um, plus, as, plus, of course, children love their, you know, dark, you know, fairy tales and whatever. Little red riding Exactly, those, exactly. Mm. Loved by them, those things. Exactly. Uh, yeah, interesting. So has there been kind of a, was there kind of an overlap, a blurring of the edges between the childhood world and the DMT world in some way, and that the child is somehow um, uh, referencing and or recalling in some way or just getting I mean, the sense? This is, it sounds like another footnote to Plato, you know, the myth of air, if you read that in the Republic. It's, no. um, yeah, we're in this different realm before we're born, and then due to the trauma of childbirth, we forget it all, you know, so... Mm. Right, so, so and then, and, you know, this probably was the case that Plato was, um, you know, participating in the Eleusinian mysteries, whether it was mm. kind of, you know, the story around the patient. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it can't be proved because you weren't allowed to speak about it, really. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, yeah, fascinating. So, so I think we've really gone through that. And so, information, consciousness, how you understand it. I mean, what you've added a lot to, to it, basically saying you're a, an idealist, really classify it that way in a sense yeah um, or a pantheist almost and and um and then the consciousness stuff which is uh, related there too um yeah so, so um is there anything else let me have a look here there was a the stuff on time we didn't mention but i don't think we need to go into that no and there was uh, yeah i mean you, you you wrote a lot about the kind of dimensions and stuff i don't think there was anything um I mean, I think in this case we're in agreement because I, yeah. you know, as well, I'm interested, I just gave a talk in uh, my hometown actually on hyperspace and psychedelics a few days ago in Berlin recently, and um, I'm quite, I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm quite positive to that view that there are there, there's a possibility of other dimensions of space mm. and time. I mean, as is physics, you know, M theory, string theory, blah blah. It's just sure, it's, sure. Oh yeah, I think it's mathematics just, certainly. Mm, yeah, philosophy is very oh. interesting. You know, like um. You know, John Smithies, friend of Huxley and Osmond, he, he wrote a, some very interesting books and articles about hyperspace and how to explain consciousness through hyperspace. Um, fascinating stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't disagree with that. I think a lot of people might find that too much, but I don't, so let's not go into it. Yeah, I think one, one thing that people do... So I was watching a, um, a video this morning of this, this woman, I forget her name, or I kind of do remember her name, but I don't want to say it. Uh, who was who was ranting? She does these rants on YouTube. She doesn't have many followers, but anyway, uh, and she was, she was uh, not one of them. No, but someone sent me a link, no, and it was she was she had a copy of your review. And she was ranting. Yeah, yeah. Some of the link later. <laughs> well, yeah, she seems a bit, you know, she's not quite right. Um, um, she's um, a couple of standard deviations short of the. Uh, the mean I think you would probably say something like that uh, but anyway yeah she was she was raging because um, she I think the title of her talk was that scientists promote DMT death cult or DM, suicide by DMT or something like that um, and yeah I mean, that is the, la the last page of, of my book and the idea this idea of transcription and I, I don't know um, and so yeah so she was she was reading from your uh, review the part where it says finally winning the game occurs once transcription of mind is completed the original lane will likely be dissolved uh, this means to anyone observing from outside the DMT space from the Kansas world the grid he will appear to have died yeah she took great issue with that um, and you know <laughs> did you did you get the impression um, you know she, she her her thought was that um, you know loads of vulnerable people um, are now going to think that this is a, a way of escaping from the horrors of life, and I, I think it's out. You know, personally, I think it's outrageous. The idea that someone, someone who is suicidal, would hook themselves up to DMT for three days <laughs> as a means of. <laughs> Mind you, if you're going to commit suicide, you know that is a good option. To be, to be fair, uh, right? It? Yeah, exactly. Um, I well, agree. Yeah, he went out with LSD, didn't he? Yeah, well, well exactly. it wasn't suicide; it was um, yeah. known death. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, you can't. I don't think you can. Um, 
there's always going to be people out there who misinterpret and uh, misuse your work. And I, I've got similar problems with something I wrote about uh, nihilism once that it's used by certain criminals, apparently. Um, but <laughs> it's, um, you know, I mean, Einstein's work was used for nuclear bombs, you know, so he was, yeah. well, it's not supposed to come out with relativity because we can misuse it. No, I mean, this is the uh, price knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Misinterpretation, misuse, abuse. I wouldn't worry about it, but I'd love to see that video now. So you'll have to send me the link. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send you the All the viewers are now sort of Googling it. Oh, yeah. She is horrified. Yeah, mortified. Um, um, she uses a, a Rick and Morty video, a DVD, to, to emphasize how mortified she is by it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, anyway, uh, I'll send you that link. Um, yeah. Tell me what you think yeah. of her. But um, yeah, I'm kind of hoping there isn't kind of a, a more general kind of pushback or uprising against this as being you know, a scientist that promote, promotes a, a death cult, you know, and you can imagine kind of certain publications latching onto the idea. Uh, it might actually uh, work in your favor, though. I mean, you know, you can uh, see that in the Daily Mail. So. <laughs> That's true, yeah. And, uh, and then more people buy your book. Yeah, yeah. I could even maybe get it banned. <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah, Well, that's the ideal. I yeah, was hoping our TED Talk would be banned, but unfortunately yeah. it went through. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is the ideal. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank well, you. thanks. I mean, I think you've uh, clarified a lot of that. And um, what, I think, what I think ultimately it comes to is this, that it's not that you really disagree with my review. It's rather that there are additional elements yes. that would um, make harmonize the review with what you really believe, but that would have to be then in your sequel, I suppose, or the addendum yeah. or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I think it would have, if I had attempted to flesh out everything, um, yeah. then you would, you would have lost it. It wouldn't have been a, a clear narrative. I mean, it's a thick book already, and yeah. it's laden with you know concise information. So, of course, not. Yeah. Um, and I think there's an interesting um, further work that could be done then, linking it to some form of idealism, integrated information theory, how it relates to that panpsychism, um, and some kind of theology, perhaps as well, some modern type of theology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've sort of thought of it like sort of computation, computational idealism or something. The idea of itself. Yeah, there's, there's a term. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> like that. In a way, that that's simulationism, isn't it? I suppose. Well, that's actually another interesting point. Actually, is you you do refer to it as simulation in, in Ah, but I have a footnote. Okay. I do have a footnote, and I say simulation or instantiation. Yeah, instantiation. I know that you're careful to because yeah. I think the basic point is a simulation implies that. You're, you're simulating a real reality, as it were. Yes. Simulation. Whereas you, there's no further reality. That is the fundamental basis and instantiation. Yep. However, after what you've said now, there is, in a way, a more fundamental, potentially sentient reality sure. under it. So it sort of then is a simulation. Well, it's, it's an instantiation. I would still call it an inst For example, if you were to generate a, a, a life in a computer, digital, some kind of digital life, that would be, I would re regard that as an instantiation of something living. Um, it would be uh, perhaps a lower dimensional form of life, but would be a very different form of life than we are recognized in our normal carbon-based life forms. But it wouldn't be, you wouldn't have to regard it as being a simulation of, of, a, of, a, of a living organism. It would be a type of life. And, and, and I see Maybe, um, our reality as a type of life. Yeah, so I think, you know, I don't see, I think when you start talking about simulation theory, you're into Bostrom territory and the idea that post-humans are simulating their ancestors, um, so there would have been, um, you know, a real counterpart to everything we see around us and to y yourself and myself. Um, I don't think that's the case, and I try and distance myself yeah. from that, uh, because you're right, you know, simulated, the simulated always, the simulation always requires the simulated counterpart um, um, that is, must be in some way the same in a sense or you know a higher dimensional copy, you know, copy thereof yeah. yeah yeah exactly so you know that's why i'm, I'm quite mm. careful not to use yeah. the words Although there are there are, there are there are parallels of course of course oh yeah there's no doubt about it yeah i mean in terms mm. of being digital reality yeah encoded then yeah it feels like simulation theory but mm. it's not <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah okay well thanks a lot for your time andrew i really appreciate it and Thank you for your time. Person sometime soon ish. But, yes. Uh, yes. We're back in the Europe. And there you have it. Dr. Andrew Gallimore and Dr. Peter Schwerstead Hughes. I know I said England. Um, I don't really know how 
England work specifically, but I'm told people from Cornwall like to be, <laughs> um, indicated as, uh, being from Cornwall, uh, just like the Welsh like to be, uh, indicated that they're from Wales. So Peter Swear said he was from Cornwall. <laughs> and so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, again, check out our online offerings at psychedelicstoday.com under online courses, tell a friend about the show or, even better would be leaving a review on iTunes or on your iPhone's podcast app um, or on Google or Facebook. We'd love it. We'd really love it. And uh, a way you can get involved with our community. We've got a really vibrant 2200 person community on Facebook right now. Just search psychedelics today group. You could find it and we'd love to have you. All right. That's it for today. Thank you all for tuning in and can't wait to see you on the next episode. This is Joe Moore signing off from Psychedelics Today in Breckenridge, Colorado. Bye-bye.